All right, I'm incredibly excited for this video. It's got everything. We're going to build an incredibly powerful and capable home lab and self-hosting server start to finish together. We're going to go through all the parts, why we chose the hardware we chose, 3D print a freaking awesome case for the system, and at the end, well, I might have a surprise for you guys. If you're looking to build your next home lab or self-hosting system, stick around. You're not going to want to miss this. Hey there, home lovers, self hosters, IT pros, and engineers. Rich here. It has been a minute since we spec'd, designed, and built out a DIY home lab server. And this time, friends, we're building a one of a kind system that can do it all virtualization, LXC, containers, NAS functionality, transcoding, and more. And we're taking it one step further by 3D printing the actual case it is going in. And this isn't some janky Rich did this in Tinkercad in five minutes case either. I think the best place for us to start here is with the parts going into the system and why we chose them first. This is everything that's going into our awesome self-hosting system. I think the first place for us to start here is with the foundation, the core, the soul of the system, the motherboard. This is the star of the show, the Minisform BD790i X3D Mini ITX motherboard. This little powerhouse has some incredible features that make it stand out as the perfect board for a home lab server or even a gaming desktop system. The BD790i X3D features an AMD Ryzen 7945HX3D CPU with 16 cores, 32 threads, a boost clock up to 5.4 GHz, a TDP of 100 watts, and includes an AMD Radeon 610M GPU on die. The board features two DDR5 dual-channel SODIMM slots with a maximum capacity of 96 GB of RAM. For storage, the board features two PCIe 5.0 4X M.2 NVMe slots. Network connectivity is provided by a dedicated 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port and Wi-Fi 6E plus Bluetooth 5.3. For ports, the BD790i X3D features two USB 2.0 Type-A ports, two USB 3.2 Type-A ports, one USB 3.2 Type-C port, HDMI 2.1, DisplayPort 1.4, and standard audio line-in, line-out, and microphone jacks. This board retails on Amazon for around $528 US. There are some incredible features that I want to call attention to on this board. First off, the included custom designed CPU heatsink. This board has a unique heatsink included to keep it cool and low profile. Just add your favorite 120mm fan and it's ready to go. Next, the board features a dedicated NVMe cooler to help maintain optimal temperatures for those PCIe 5.0 4X M.2 NVMe's. That cooler easily removes with just two screws and comes with a pre-installed silicon pad. Just remember to pull off the protective film. Minisform was kind enough to send us this board for this build, so thank you to them for that. This is going to be the perfect foundation for our system because it's compact, powerful, flexible, and energy efficient for all of you home labbers with high power costs. Moving on, let's talk about the RAM and storage going into the system. Let's start off with the RAM. For this build, we're going to be adding 48GB of DDR5-5600 SODIMM memory, which is plenty of RAM for running a small Proxmox or TrueNAS scale deployment or anything else your heart desires. We're going with Crucial for this build because it's the perfect balance between performance and price. We picked up this set from Amazon for $107 US. Now let's talk about storage. First, let's talk about NVMe storage. For this build, we're going to be using a Crucial P3 Plus 2TB NVMe SSD. 2TB of ultra-fast NVMe is perfect for any home lab or self-hosting scenario as the primary boot OS. This stick cost us $120 US shipped to our door. This is a PCIe 4.0 NVMe SSD. And before you get all ragey in the comments about this not being a PCIe 5.0 SSD, chill. There is a reason for this. First off, we don't need the mind-blowing speeds of PCIe 5.0 for a boot drive for a home lab server. And second, we're not going to be using the included Minisform NVMe cooler, which would kind of be necessary to really get the performance out of any PCIe 5.0 NVMe SSD. Why are we not using the NVMe cooler, you ask? Great question. Because we're going to be installing this guy here. This is the Rytop M.2 to SATA 3.0 adapter that will provide us with six total SATA 3 ports that we'll need to drive the primary storage for the system. This little guy was affordable at just $38 US. Which leads us to the next question. What and how much storage is going into this system? We'll be outfitting the system with five Western Digital 4TB Red Plus NAS hard disks. 
Total raw space will be around 20 terabytes of storage and is plenty of space for even the largest uh, Linux ISO library. The Red Plus NAS drives are CMR drives designed for NAS duty. We've had nothing but the best of luck with WD drives as of late, and these drives are the perfect balance between price, performance, and storage, coming in at around $85 US each. Okay, motherboard, RAM, and storage out of the way, let's talk about GPUs. Even though the BD790i X3D has high performance dedicated graphics on die, what self-respecting home lab or self-hosting server doesn't have a dedicated GPU for transcoding? That's where this guy comes in. This is the Sparkle A310 Eco. By this point, you guys have seen this card talked about by a ton of other tech tubers because of its powerhouse AV1 encoding and decoding. But that's not the only reason why it's perfect for this build. First off, this card is a single slot in width, is only powered by the 16x PCIe slot, and is incredibly energy efficient. It's the right card for the job, and your Plex server will thank you for it. Moving on. The last bit of actual hardware to go into the system is the PSU. And for that, we're going to go with the Silverstone Extreme 500 Bronze PSU. This 500 watt PSU from Silverstone is the perfect power supply for this build, especially since it features an SFX form factor, making it incredibly compact and space efficient. 500 watts should be more than enough power for all of the hardware in this build and leave some overhead left in case of future upgrades. Not much more to say about this power supply other than it's the right size, wattage, and price at 110 US from Amazon. All right, let's talk about the case. During one of our weekly home lab live streams, you should check those out by the way, I threw out a few case suggestions to the audience for this computer. I had some really great options lined up. There were some John Spo cases, a Silverstone or two in the mix, and all of them were really fantastic options. But you guys in the chat had a better idea for me. Aragorn Strider suggested this guy here. This is the mass stackable NAS ITX enclosure made by Modcase. But it's not just any old case, it's a 3D printed case. I have to admit, at first, I wasn't too hot on the idea of 3D printing a case for this build. I've seen some pretty janky 3D printed cases before, and I've made my fair share of them as well. Remember Frank and Nass? Given the quality of the hardware going into this, I was worried that the end result would be flimsy, unstable, and honestly ugly. So I first checked out the free version of the mass case, and the more I started to dig into it, the more I started to fall in love with the idea of doing this. This is a one-of-a-kind build, why not make a one-of-a-kind case for it too? So I bought the premium version of the case to get all the extras, show them some love for good engineering, and I set out to start 3D printing this case. Here's why I fell in love with this case. First off, the form factor is brilliant. I'm a huge fan of minimalistic case designs that are tall and sleek. Hell, the last computer I built for myself was in a low raw S2 case, so I've got some history here. Anyway, Modcase designed this to be modular, giving you the choice of how you build out your system. You want a single five bay disc module? Done. You want two of them? Knock yourself out. You want three of them? I'm kidding, you can't do three. Not only that, you can decide how to stack the different modular parts together, making it truly a one-of-a-kind build. Because this case is gonna hold components that get hot, I need to use a filament that can withstand the heat and not turn into an expensive pile of molten plastic. There are plenty of good high temperature plastics that can be used for a case like this, and Modcase themselves recommended PETG, sometimes called PETG, because of its high thermal properties and ease of printing. PETG is basically what recyclable water bottles are made out of. I typically use PLA as my filament of choice because it's the easiest plastic to print, but PLA doesn't have the thermal properties that make it suitable for this case. So, I headed to Amazon to find some PETG that would suit this build, and I decided to give the Elegoo Rapid PETG filament a try. Elegoo's Rapid PETG is rapid because it has a print speed capable of up to 600 millimeters a second, which means you can get your prints done faster. And it didn't hurt that a pack of two one kilo spools only cost 26 bucks delivered to my door. But I wasn't happy with the output from the prints. Don't get me wrong, the print quality was fine, but the finished prints were just incredibly shiny, just like a water bottle, and I didn't like how that looked. I want to be proud of this case when it's complete and not put off by it, so I headed back to Amazon to find an alternative PETG. That's when I came across the Polymaker Fiberon PETG filament. Here's why I like it. First off, it has frickin' carbon nanotubes in it for the intended purpose of providing ESD protection, meaning it's meant for printing enclosures for electronics. It's also stiffer and more rigid than typical PETG filament, probably because of all those carbon nanotubes, which means it'll be a better case material anyway. But here's the big downside. This stuff is expensive. Each roll is a half kilo, and it costs more than a typical one kilo roll of PETG, coming in at around $30 US. So yeah, it sucks it's more expensive, 
expensive, but the quality of the prints it makes is so much nicer than the other PETG filament, and it has the ESD protection and the added rigidity, so I feel like the benefits outweigh the cost. Sometimes using the more expensive stuff is the right option for the job. Enough talk about the case, it's time to get 3D printing and to put this case together. Here are all the different 3D printed parts that are going into this case. There are a ton of them. Total print time, two days, 14 hours, and 50 minutes of combined runtime for everything, with thankfully no failures to report. Every part screws together using M3 by 20 screws, which are flathead self-tapping plastic screws. Let's get to building this monster case. Okay, first thing is to take the top piece here and start building the sides. So let's, let's get started. Looks good, nice and smooth. Looks good. Back of the case. Goes like that, so. Again, that looks really good. Really comes together really well. And now we have the bottom piece. It goes like this. Okay. Look at that. It's like a little cube. Looks good so far drive bays. They go together like this. And they've got little screw holes, which are hard to see right in there. Okay. So the next thing to do here is to take, set this like this, goes like this. Okay. Next part here is what they call the hat. This is the fan tray. This goes like this together. Put them around. And that's what that looks like. This is an opening for a 140 millimeter fan. Hold on like that. It'll be easy to flip this around like so. Like this to make life a little easier. This guy here goes on the bottom, caps it off. It stays for days and days. These guys are caddies. Case complete, it looks incredible. Now it's time to put all of the hardware into our newly hand-built bespoke artisanal 3D printed case. All right, I prefer to build out the motherboard before I place it into the case. So let's start by taking care of the NVMe SSD and the SATA controller. First things first, we'll remove the NVMe cooler from the board, install the crucial P3 Plus 2 terabyte NVMe disc, and then the Rytop M.2 to SATA 3.0 adapter. Now onto the crucial DDR5 Sodium RAM. We'll start with the first stick and then the second. Easy peasy. Now let's install a 120mm heatsink fan onto the built-in heatsink. I can't think of a better option to use here than a Noctua NF-A12x25 fan for this build. To mount the fan, Mini's form includes two simple metal brackets that fit into the mounting holes on the fan and are affixed with screws. Once those are affixed, the fan plus the mounting hardware is secured to the heatsink on the motherboard. Done and done. Let's get the completed board mounted into our 3D printed case. The board is a pretty exacting fit, but getting it into the mass case was no different than any other typical small form factor build. The Mini ITX motherboard has four mounting holes that are used to secure the board to the case. Showing the mounting of the motherboard is difficult because of the tight spaces, but you can see here where I'm screwing down the board using regular case screws. All four down, the board is secured. Moving on. Now let's talk about the A3 Sparkle GPU and how it mounts into the case. The first thing we need to do is swap out the mounting bracket on the card. This case requires a low-profile bracket, and the GPU comes with a full-size bracket already attached. Thankfully, the GPU comes with an additional low-profile bracket just for these occasions. After we've removed the old bracket, we'll install the new bracket, replace the screws, and we'll be ready to install. 
installation into the case is a breeze, just like any other GPU would be into a system. To secure the card into place, we use a 3D printed piece that secures the top of the bracket and screws into the case using the same screws we used to build the case. Now, let's get the PSU mounted into the back side of the case. Mounting the PSU was as simple as dropping the screws in and securing the PSU to the 3D printed case. After four screws, everything is complete. There's one final piece to install, and that's the power button for the system. After punching out the opening for the button, we pass through the wiring and affix the button mechanism to the case using the included nut. The last thing to do was to connect up the switch and the LED light in the button, and we're good to go. Which leads me to the cable connections and dressing. This is a small form factor case, so it's really hard to get my hands into the small areas to connect cables and show you what's connected at the same time. So let's just jump to the good stuff and show you the final results. Here's the motherboard side shot of the build with everything connected. You can see everything is incredibly packed in there, but I had zero problem getting the cables routed and dressed up. At the top, you can clearly see the SATA controller and the five red SATA cables running to the front of the case and down through to the drive bay below. Everything went together so well in this case. Let's take a look at the PSU side. All right, on the opposite side, we can clearly see the PSU mounted, cables secured, and again, plenty of space in the case for airflow. At the top, you can see the power button snaking through to the front side. It just looks super clean. One last spot to check, and that's the interface side of the mechanical hard disks. Here, things get just a little messier than I'd like, but trust me, it's much cleaner than it might look. All five drives have dedicated power and SATA cables connected up, and each drive is easily accessible for maintenance. Hindsight being 2020, I wish I would have used black SATA cables, but hey, it's totally fine. If you're wondering how the cover pieces secure in place on the case, it's with these 3D printed clips that secure inside four openings around each of the removable panel sides. Now let's get these sides on and close up the case. First, the motherboard cover. And finally, the PSU cover. Now let's get a good look at this sexy black monolith of a home lab server. Look at this system, you guys. I can't believe how incredibly it turned out. It's got everything you'd want in a low-power, high-performance home lab server. It's got cores and clock speeds for days and storage for years. This system will run Proxmox, XCPNG, TrueNAS scale, hell, even Windows, and it will do it in style. I am absolutely in love with the way the system turned out. Okay, so let's recap and go over the good and the bad, starting with the good. I'm in love with the Minis Forum BD790i X3D motherboard. It is such a perfect platform for a build like this. It was easy to build, drop in, and use. I've been testing TrueNAS Scale and Proxmox on it, and it just happily eats through all the performance tasks like nobody's business. And the case, what can I say about the 3D printed case? Modcase wasn't messing around. This was designed by people who know how to model and design cases, and the end product is proof of that. Hands down, if you own a 3D printer and you want to attempt this, don't wait, do it now. So now let's talk about the bad. Hmm. Was there actually any bad? Actually, yeah, there was one part that I'm disappointed with. The mass case design features the option for adding a 7-inch LCD display to the PSU side of the case. I really wanted to make that a reality for this case, but no matter what I did, I just couldn't get the case panel with the display they recommended to actually fit. Oh well. So let's talk about what it would cost to build a system like this yourself, assuming you had a 3D printer to make the case. The whole system with all the components, 3D printed filament and all, came to a grand total of $1,687.41 which I think is a steal for anyone looking to build a little beast of a home lab server that can do everything and more and not break the bank. So let's get to the surprise. I'm really proud of how this turned out, and while I'd love to keep this system for myself, I'd rather make some home labbers day by doing a giveaway for this system. So I'm gonna do just that. There are some limitations that we need to talk about though. This will only be for US residents, not because they don't love my international friends and viewers, we have quite a few of them actually, but I can't afford to pay the tariffs and shipping fees for a system like this, so that's just not gonna happen. Also, I'm not a computer company. I don't offer warranties or returns or technical support, but if you do run into problems, our Discord community may be able to help you, so join. And one last thing, I've gotta build out the giveaway and get that all squared away, so keep an eye out for the official announcement and the link to get signed up. I'll probably use Gleam.io to run this whole thing like I've done in the past. And with that, friends, we will call this video to an end. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.